Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the praise and thank you for the precious prayer, Bernice. And uh, thank you for the good food, right? Did you enjoy the good food and good fellowship? And uh, we, we are uh, in the lesson 25th, uh, 20, uh, 50, 25th, 50, 50 second lesson. <laughs> Uh, this is the last lesson in the book that we have been studying, and uh, the next book hasn't come yet. The next book, uh, so what we are going to do after this, uh, next week and uh, for the remainder of January, I will be sharing uh, other studies uh, with you, and then for the month of February... We have a special speaker for, uh, and you've been waiting for this time, uh, for the month of February. Oh, she is there. <laughs> our special speaker sitting on, all the way at the end over there, uh, our missionary, uh, Lauren, will be sharing uh, Bible studies. Looking forward? Yes. Amen? Yeah, let's, uh, let's pray for her <laughs> and pray for the studies. So... Uh, we will have our uh, missionaries and evangelists and myself rotating in uh, month by month uh, to share the Bible study. Uh, and then we'll, we will, uh, we have other plans too. So, so maybe you will be teaching too. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's, let, please be praying for our ministerial team. And uh, let's pray that Zion Church Every word that is uh, put forward will be the word of our Father, and that word will have the power to change our lives. Amen? Amen. So today, we're, we will finish this book, Lesson 52, The Church, the Bride of Jesus Christ. The Church, the Bride of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, we will read it in the introduction. The Bible compares the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church as a bridegroom and his bride. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32 says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So in this lesson, we will look at what the church, the bride of Jesus Christ, should be like. And I think this, this is appropriate for us as we are still in January, beginning stage of, uh, of this new year. Uh, what should we be like in, uh, as Jesus' bride? So uh, first, we must love with agape love. The first task is very hard. What kind of love does Jesus love us with? Agape love. What do you know agape love as? What's the one word that explains agape love? Unconditional. Do you think you can love Jesus with agape love? Raise your hand if you can love Jesus with unconditional love. <laughs> we say amen, but uh, no hand are raised. <laughs> Are we able to really? We love Jesus. We love God, right? But are we able to love Him the same way He loved us? I think it's almost impossible. Impossible. Because this agape love, kind of like the word bara, is only applied to God when He does it. Agape love, I think, only applies to God when He gives love. Our love is limited. First um, John chapter four verse eight says, First John chapter four verse eight says, "God is love." Right? So that's what He is. He Himself is love. That's what He does. That's what He is. But we are you. Can you say, "I am love"? Anybody? I am love. <laughs> People around me might say, uh, Pastor Sam equals, you know, here it says God equals love. 
what's Pastor Sam equal to? Bitterness. <laughs> Corniness. All the, all the negative things. What I'm trying to say is, we don't have the capability innate in us to love with agape love. We're all conditional. Agape, the Greek word agape, means love in the Bible. And it's the love that comes from God. God's love is not sentimental love. God's love is not conditional, meaning we often like people that like me. I, we often like people that are good to me. But for God, it's unconditional because He unilaterally gives that love. He is the source of agape love. So how are we to love God? with this agape love. What does it mean for us to love God back? I thought about this for quite a long time, and I cannot say I, I have the answer or, uh, even now. But I thought one aspect I thought about this is parent love, parents' love towards their children. And I think that's the, probably the closest you can get to agape love. Parents love towards their, ch their children. It's almost unconditional. Right? And how do the children reciprocate that love? Parents, what do the children have to do in order for you to feel like, wow, they're loving me back? I love them. And many times, p parents, is it true that you don't feel like you get the love back as much as you give? Okay. Parents are just kind of smiling with their eyes because their children might realize. But, but really, let's think with me. Uh, what, can you, what do the children have to do to make the parents feel like, wow, my kids really love me? What do they? If you are children, if you have parents, also think about this. What, what, what do they have to do? Do they need to do the same thing that the parents do the, to the, the children? No, right? Well, how, do you, how do you love them back? Can somebody, sh you know, you can speak out, speak out, uh, raise your hand, or you can just talk. Oh, obedience? Wow. Wow. That's hard. Huh? Children? <laughs> Obey me then I'll equate that to love. Uh, is that it really? What, what uh, okay, obedience is one. Uh, uh, just a hug. Children come, kids come to the mom and dad, just give them a hug. And the parents feel, oh, this is love. I think I can relate to that, right? Michelle was saying something. Uh, so expression that mom and dad is in their heart, right? right? That's it. That's it. That's what the parents, that's what moves the parents to feel that love. And many parents cannot exchange that love with anything else. The children did not have to do much. Just come and hug. Draw, you know, thoughtlessly drew, drew, drew a picture. It happens to be mother. Lucky, lucky child. <laughs> but thoughtlessly, but mommy was in her, in her heart. That's why it was expressed on the picture, right? When, when the parents see that they, their image is in them, in the children. When the parents see that the, all the love that I poured out to that child was felt by that child, when you realize that love was felt by the child, that's all the parents need, right? right? I think it's probably the same thing. We don't have the ability to agape love back God. 
We cannot get on the cross. For, you and I, to be honest, I don't think you and I are ready right now to get on the cross for the salvation of Jesus. <laughs> we cannot do the same thing that he did for us. And that's what I'm trying to say. However, when we live, I think when Elder said obedience, when we live the way of his love, when we live according to how he loved us, when we actually express in some way, God, I received your love. That's when we are reciprocating the love. We are to love God and others with agape love. But agape is a choice. A deliberate striving for another's higher good. That's agape love that we human beings can, can practice. Doing something for the benefit of the other person. And is demonstrated through action. That's where obedience comes in. Demonstrated through action. You can say all you, all you can, I love you, I love you back, whatever. But if the action doesn't follow, that's not true love. So when we are to love God with agape love, it's reciprocating or responding to His unconditional love with the measures that I can use or do to say, I love you back. To put into action my heart. Kind of like Abigail putting, in, putting into action of drawing her love towards mom. She didn't say, I love you, three words. But that picture was speaking louder than her words. Right? Likewise, what we do in our life sends the message to our Father in heaven that we love Him. So, this year, let us try to practice this agape love. And um, those who did not receive love cannot love. Child development, uh, you know, education, we all learn. In order for children to, to be stable, to, uh, to uh, be able to love, they need to receive love. But, of course, they need to receive the right kind of love. We also cannot practice this agape love until we realize the love that we are receiving. So I pray, let us pray to God. God, allow me to... We know we are being loved. But sometimes we don't feel it. Sometimes we don't realize it. So let us pray, God, help me to realize, help me to feel, help me to see your love in my life. That's the only way we can become stable spiritually and grow and be able to love. May God's love overflow in you. Amen? Be loved by God. No, thank you? <laughs> okay. Let's turn to somebody that's not your family member. Or that's not your friend. And say, you are loved. Not with a question mark, you are loved. <laughs> Not with a question mark, with exclamation mark, you are loved. And then now turn to a, a different person, turn to a different person and say, he told me I am loved. <laughs> or she told me I am loved. And then respond, yes, you are loved. It's complicated. Okay, back to the text. First John, uh, it is only natural for saints to love Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, in return for the love received from Jesus. So we have to receive that love first. First John chapter 4, verse 19 says, We love because he first loved us. The word love appears twice here, and both are the Greek word agapao, which means agape love, and, and it's in the verbal form. 
And in his unconditional agape love for the sinners, Jesus offered his body, holy body as a ransom for the cross, on the cross. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We too must love the Lord with agape love. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all, the, all your soul and with your mind. Here, heart, soul, and mind refer to the entire being. Hence, we must offer all our love, our, uh, our all to love Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Second, we must obey. Oh, there it is. We must obey. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 5, 24, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Here again, wife is the church, husband is Christ. Here is the word, uh, the phrase is subject, uh, is the Greek word hypotasso, and is a compound word consisting of hypo or hypos, meaning under, and tasso means arranged. Therefore, hypotasso means arranged under something. This verse tells us that wives need to keep order with their husband, just like the order of the church and Christ. The church is always under Jesus and submits to him, and Christ cares for the church. What do you think is easier or harder? Husbands, uh, wives, uh, obey your husbands. Husbands, love your wife as yourself. What's harder? <laughs> so wives say submission is harder. Husbands say loving is harder. <laughs> Likewise, even at home, wives must submit to their husbands. And that submission is not uh, like slave contract. Remember, and husbands must love their wives. We obey God's word because God's word is full of love. We follow God's word because God's word is according to his will and is full of blessings. Husbands, when we tell our wives, the Bible says you need to be submissive. Husbands, remember your words better have some power of love and blessings. And it's not, it's not just talking about you know, uh, day, daily obedience and command. We're talking about Jesus and the church. Each and every one of us, we are the bride. Whether you're male or female, together we are the bride. And Jesus is the bridegroom. Today, the saints must become true brides who only obey Jesus Christ. We must be holy. We must keep the chastity. Of faith. The husband and wife must keep their chastity, meaning pure fidelity, sexual purity. The church must welcome Jesus, the bridegroom, as a pure virgin. A church that keeps their chastity of faith does not defile itself with heretical ed uh, editorials or wrong ideas or ideologies, but keeps the purity of the old traditional faith. A lot of people are saying, what if I'm not pure already? <laughs> Our pure faith means just as a wife has only one husband. Husband has only one wife. We, the church, the bride, we have only one husband. Who is that? Jesus Christ. And anything else is considered religiously idolatry, relationship-wise, adultery. All right. So who do you believe in? Who do you live for? What is your life about? The answer should be simple, one. Not many things. Our, uh, we know in our heads, Jesus is the only purpose, only one that I live for. But then, in our life, are we pure? Is that the title? And then the actual life is 
about money, about this, about that. So when it says, keep the chastity of faith. And sometimes purity or virginity cannot be returned. I heard there are surgeries that people go through to, to fake virginity these days. Uh, we're not talking about that. But Jesus, remember, the women that interacted with Jesus, that came to Jesus, they represent the church. They represent us. And these women that came to Jesus in the Gospels, they were not, mostly, they were not clean. They were either demon-possessed or prostitution or, or sinful and so on. Remember the woman that was caught in the middle of adultery and was brought to Jesus. But what does Jesus do? Jesus cleanses her to purity. That's the amazing grace, amazing salvation power. Even though we are so filthy right now, once Jesus comes and happens upon us, we can become spiritually virgin, pure. Do you believe that? We need to begin this year with purity and ask God, God, help me to stay pure. Spiritually, physically also. Something about uh, Reverend Abraham Park was teaching about uh, adultery and, and sexual immorality. And something interesting the Bible teaches us, something that is so closely related. Some, oftentimes we, we say spiritual and this is physical. But this one subject is both, all, oftentimes, go together, physical and spiritual. This impurity, adultery, immoral, immorality, this go together, spiritually and physically. So you cannot just say, oh, I'm spiritually pure, but you're physically not pure. So this is one thing that we need to pray for ourselves. We also need to pray for our, our youth, young adults, our children, for God to protect them in their purity. The Bible refers to the church uh, that abandons the, abandons the chastity of faith and commits spiritual adultery as Babylon, harlot, and a prostitute. So, therefore, what we are fighting against in the end time, the final War is against Babylon, against the great harlot of Babylon. This is the great fight that we need to fight. The 144,000 who stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb in the last days are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have themselves kept themselves chaste. And lastly, we must always be Awake and prepare to meet Jesus. The saints must always be awake to welcome the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, at any given time. When the bridegroom arrived, the five prudent virgins who prepared the lamps and oil entered the wedding feast with the bridegroom. But the five foolish virgins whose lamps went out because they did not prepare the oil could not enter the wedding feast. Matthew 25 verse 13 says, be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Here, be on the alert is a present imperative active form of the Greek word gregoreo, gregoreo, which means to be awake or to be on the alert. Kind of opposite when we say groggy or sleepy. Gregoreo it means to be awake. Okay? Emphasizing the need to keep awake continuously. Do you think Jesus will come this year? <laughs> what a question. There are a lot of people who are saying uh, he's not going to come. Why? Give me five good reasons right now why he's not going to come this year. Because I'm not ready. Because the war hasn't happened. No, there's no reason why he's not going to come. So we cannot prove that he can, he's not going to come. We also cannot prove 
that he's, he's going to come. So the res- the, therefore, we, we better be ready. <laughs> we better be ready. So if he comes tonight, what is he going to do? How many of you can say, Come, Lord Jesus. I'm ready. <laughs> is your life that hard? <laughs> or how many, how many of you will say, Lord, hold, <laughs> wait, just, I want to get married at least <laughs> before you come. <laughs> Somebody who just got married is laughing at you. <laughs> So, so are we ready? Are we ready? Let us live a life where we are ready. And just being ready doesn't mean, oh, I'm ready. I, life is miserable anyway. <laughs> just go. Let's go. <laughs> Come. No. Being ready means we need to prepare the oil. Are we ready with the Word of God? Are we ready with the oil of God's Holy Spirit? Let's be ready. A bride who is awake is a bride who pr- prays. Luke 21, 36, be, but keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. When Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he also ordered the three disciples to keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. Our, uh, one of the cell, cell groups had a service, uh, launching service of the, for the beginning of the year. The message that I shared just now is God is looking for people who will devote themselves to pray. May we be the ones that are awake in prayer and the bride that our Lord Jesus loves with agape love. Amen? Let us pray. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Before, uh, before we pray, uh, announcement. Uh, on Sundays after our Bible studies, I'd like to encourage our cell groups to get together and at least have a time of prayer. Uh, uh, and if you cannot get together now after Bible studies, uh, I, I told the cell group leaders already, but uh, maybe you can uh, gather some other time during the week uh, or even on Zoom to, to share and pray. But I'd like for us to make it a, a, a regular thing for every week after Bible study. That we give you like five to ten minutes for the cell groups to get together and catch up and, and share prayer requests. Yeah? Okay. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for being our bridegroom that will come back to take us home. Father, help us to be ready and help us to help please allow every member of Zion Church to receive and experience and feel enough of your, your agape love overflowingly so that we can be sharers uh, and, and givers of this agape love to other people and help us to reciprocate, help us to uh, respond to your agape love with our heart, with our action, with our obedience. Thank you so much for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.